Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 21 of Syracuse Sports. My name is Brent Dax. So glad to have you here. No, 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 no. Don't take your shoes off. It's a podcast. All right. How'd you get here today? Did you just find us magically on the internet? That's cool. But the best way is to subscribe or follow on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts. You follow. It's there. And man, this is America, Jack. We want you to listen whenever you want on demand sitting right there in your feed you get to it when you want we hope you get to it relatively soon because then you might forget about it if you're anything like me i'll get to it later and then you never get to it so whatever you do we greatly appreciate it you can make your voice heard on this program we've got a voicemail line 315-552-1964 is the number leave us a message anytime about anything i would imagine a lot of it's going to be syracuse sports related but maybe you've got a great buffalo chicken wing dip you want to share we'll take it you can also get in touch on twitter brent dax media email b-a-x-e at syracuse.com as well syracuse football new york city it's something we've heard quite often lately particularly with the orange playing in the pinstripe bowl three times in the last decade But with Clemson in the rearview mirror this year, Syracuse football will now embark on a 34-day stretch without a game played in the JMA Dome. That's the third longest stretch in college football this season. Now, the last time Syracuse did not have a home game in the month of October, 2008, two buys and two road games kept SU out of the Dome. There's only two home games left this season overall, Friday, Friday, November 3rd against Boston College and Saturday, November 25th, against Wake Forest, two days after Thanksgiving. So that means between now and the time you're really Christmas shopping, one home game at the Dome. So why the tumbleweeds in the Dome this October? Well, according to Syracuse Athletic Director John Wildhack, it's all for the brand. See, Syracuse was supposed to host Pitt at the Dome, but that game was moved to Yankee Stadium to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the first collegiate game played there, Pitt and Syracuse, 1923, at the old Yankee Stadium, of course. Well, that's a nice footnote. That's not why Syracuse moved the game. That would be the nice pile of free money that Syracuse found from the Yankees to move it there. Now, Wild Hack doesn't really deny this. He told Syracuse.com's Chris Carlson that Syracuse Deputy AD Herm Frazier Got a really, really good deal from the Yankees and, quote, we wouldn't do it unless it was economically advantageous, end quote. He insists that money gets reinvested in the program and in the athletic department itself. Now, Wild Hack has also been on the record saying that the Yankee Stadium game raises SU's profile. It gets the attention of recruits. It will allow Syracuse to do some fundraising in New York City. I'm sure Jim Beheim and his new role of chief fundraiser will be dispatched to the Big Apple hobnob and get those alums to open up the checkbook. Now, a source involved with the discussions told me that Syracuse really wanted this game to be played in October. The Yankees, of course, have to block out October in case they make a World Series run. I'm laughing because the Yankees, the mighty 27-time world champion New York Yankees, didn't even make the playoffs this year. So strike one there. Now, we're still a month away from this game. Anything can happen in that time. But Pitt's struggling this year. They're currently 1-4. and four. Removing the home field advantage may not matter for Syracuse. It hasn't mattered in recent years. Pitt has won 18 of the last 21 games in this series with the Orange. So this move may literally pay off for Wild Hack and company. I just want to know what the direct benefit will be, and I think it'll benefit Syracuse to disclose it and certainly will be on us, the media, to find out how. How much did Syracuse make off this game? Where is the money going? If you're reinvesting in the program, how are you doing that? What recruits were gained specifically from playing at Yankee Stadium? How much fundraising money came in from that strong New York City alumni base I hear so much about? What were the ticket sales in terms of benefiting Syracuse by playing at Yankee Stadium versus a home game at the Dome where, let's face it, Attendance hasn't been overflowing this year. An average of 35,917 fans through four home games so far. It was promised that Syracuse will never play fewer than six games at the Dome in a season. Had Pitt remained at the Dome, that would make seven home games. 
Wild Heck has said that the school tried to show appreciation to local season ticket holders, offering them things like a free ticket to any other dome event, discounts on tickets to the pit game, deals on entertainment and lodging for those making the trip to New York City. But this is a gamble on Wild Heck's part. Syracuse football has traditionally struggled on the back end of the season under Dino Babers. And to only have two home games in the final seven of the season puts this team at a strategic disadvantage on the field. But remember, guys, it's all for the brand. Short-term pain for long-term gain. We'll see if it's worth it. Now, sticking with the New York theme on the program today, I am happy to bring on my friend John Jastrzemski. Call him JJ, Syracuse alum, who if you know JJ, particularly if you are a New York sports fan, Giants, Jets, Yankees, Mets, Knicks, Islanders, Rangers, down the list. Who we forget? The Nets. You know JJ. Former voice on WFAN. He is now the host of the New York, New York podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network. Highly uh, suggest you subscribe to that, listen to that, particularly if you're a New York sports fan. You can also see him on SNY. JJ is a ball of fire. And man, think of what he's got to talk about right now, okay? The Giants are terrible. The Jets lose Aaron Rodgers, and all those hopes go down in the first game of the season, just five plays in, Aaron Rodgers out. Those Jet fans that think Zach Wilson may still be the answer. I brought it up earlier. The Yankees, not in the playoffs, yet it looks like Brian Cashman and Aaron Boom just going to check in for work once again next season. The Mets, fire Buck Showalter. They have an owner that spends a ton of money. He's accountable. He's out there public. But by all means, a very disappointing season for the New York Mets this year. JJ's all over it. I mentioned he's a Syracuse alum. He's got some passionate takes about the Orange as well. What do you say we bring him in? My guy, John Jastrzemski. JJ, you always have so much to talk about, but right now, dude, you should be potting three times a day and do a Twitter Spaces late at night and go on SNY and just 24 hours a day. You should be on the air in some capacity. This is insane. What is happening with Four of the big teams that you talk about, Giants, Jets, Yankees, and Mets, right? So let's dive right in here. I actually do want to start with baseball. The fact that we are here, if I had tapped on your shoulder on April 1st and said, listen, man, I'm I'm going to put this bet down, Yankees and Mets, not in, what would you have said? I would have given you 50 to 1. I might have given you 100 to 1, especially considering, Axe, the, the dynamic now of the postseason where you have six teams in the American League, you have six teams in the National League. That's right. I was watching some of the games yesterday, and I'm like sitting there saying to myself, how is this team in the playoffs? How is that team in the playoffs? And yet we're talking about the Yankees and the Mets with their resources, with their payrolls, and their their brands, and they're on the outside looking in. But the Yankees, hey, everything's okay in Yankee land. GM back, lifetime contract. Manager back, lifetime contract. (laughs) Let's just do an audit to figure out what went wrong this year, you know? So, uh, wild. You're not kidding, dude. Wild. See, I know how JJ feels about this with the Yankees, so I'm going to make you do something you probably don't want to do, and that is this. Give me the pitch on why that works. Try and find me the reason why bringing back Cashman and bringing back Boone will work, should work, and that's the move. I got nothing for you. I guess the only way it works, (laughs) Axe, is if they go and spend a gazillion dollars in free agency and everyone on their roster who was injury prone and aging uh, answers questions or the youngsters they have that were called up really answer questions. I guess that's a way the general manager and the manager can look smart. Um, But no, I, I don't have it for you. Listen, this should be the sort of year And I know they lost Aaron Judge, and I know things went against them. But you're the Yankees. You you have had this window in which you haven't been able to break through. You take a major step back in 2023, and yet the owner is so delusional, is so tone deaf, is so clueless that basically he's too lazy and he just is too skittish to go and make the sort of wholesale changes that are needed throughout the organization. 
But that audit is going to solve everything, though. That's it. The audit. That's you know, it. the audit the Yankees are doing yeah. is going to solve everything. So take care that. of business. And I, I hate to keep reverting to this, JJ, but it's hard not to think of this. Like George Steinbrenner is just got to be doing spins in his grave, looking at this is how the Yankees handle it. The Yankees are now about financial accountability, follow the luxury tax, stay the course, follow analytics. Like Steinbrenner would have just dropped the hammer a long time ago on this situation. And I think that's what Yankee fans appreciate him. So from what you've gathered and seen and, and observed is not only in your role in, in the media, but just as a longtime Yankees fan, why didn't it get passed down? It's a great question. Um, and let me make this clear, Ax. I do think the George narrative that you're drumming up, that I've drummed up, that many others have drummed up, it's not bulletproof. Let's, let's realize and acknowledge that George in the late 1980s, early 90s, was a disaster as an owner to the point where Yankee fans were thrilled about the fact that he was suspended for a year after Howie Spira. So there is that narrative that's out there, but you always knew this about George. He wanted to do whatever was in his power for the Yankees to go and for the Yankees to win. They were going right. to be the best. They were going to spend the most. There was nothing that was going to get in George Steinbrenner's way of the Yankees achieving that goal. And I can see how Hal Steinbrenner doesn't want to repeat the mistakes of his father. You know, there's something to that, that you see your father over a period of time and you kind of acknowledge and realize, all right, my dad did this right. My dad was really off base when it comes to maybe this set of circumstances and I'm going to be different, but it's now gotten to an extreme. And I, I got to say this, and this is no knock on my brethren and the guys and gals who are on the Yankee beat and the baseball beat. For that matter, the media, in my opinion, has given the Yankees way too big of a free pass to the point where, you yeah. know, I, I hear the the Olneys of the world and the Rosenthal's of the world. Oh, firing Aaron Boone would be a scapegoat move. Well, guess what, guys? That's how sports works. Whether it's fair, whether it's unfair, sports works a certain way. When you don't win and when there are expectations – it's not fair at times. It's not reasonable at times. Sometimes it is fair and sometimes it is reasonable that there's got to be accountability for that. And yet the Yankees, and, and for whatever the reason, this is what I've seen from a lot of the folks who are on the beat that cover the team. I don't think they go after them nearly hard enough as far as I'm concerned. They want access. Uh, you know, they want to have those relationships. And I know that's a delicate balance to deal with. I understand it. I totally get it. But at times, Zach, I feel like, and maybe this is me just being in my own little world here, you know, I have my platform, I do what I do, and I know at times I poke fun, and I definitely probably take it beyond measures <laughs> that maybe I should take it. That's fine. But I'm sitting there looking at the Yankee situation. They don't make any changes in the offseason, and it's like acceptance. Acceptance from the baseball community, acceptance from the Yankee media, and it's like, well, hold on a second. The fans aren't accepting of it. Then why are we in this position? I do think that plays a big role in it because I agree. If you don't have enough people going after, and I'm not just talking fans. I'm talking about people who have major, powerful voices. You know, within the sport, who cover the sport, not going after the Yankees. Th th there's a problem there. I feel like there's a transition there in this new world you're in, in, in podcasts, you know, uh, JJ was on WFAN for a while took kind of the traditional route, goes to Syracuse, wants to be a talk show host, works his way onto the airwaves, but then gets a new opportunity here in digital media. And I feel like, and I'm not just tooting your horn here, JJ, more people have to find this. I think you've got a great audience that has, I enjoy listening to the Twitter spaces and some fans that have found it and have followed you there. But I look, I'm a, I'm a Red Sox fan, but I, I read the New York papers and follow the New York sports scene just because it's fun. I just don't see it and I don't hear it. There are notable exceptions. I love Mike Vaccaro at the post. I love some of the people you talk to on SNY. I think there are some people on the air in that city that somewhat hold feet to the fire. But the space where I think the you have been most honest about the Yankees is, is right here. And JJ comes from the fact, I think you tell me if I'm wrong here, like this sounds so damn simple, but there's too many people in, in our line of work that lose sight of this at the heart of it. 
at the end of the day, you are a fan and you want to see the Yankees, I don't know, get back to the Yankees of what they were. Be Act the like the Yankees. They should now. Yeah. Act like the Yankees. Yeah. Act, there you, you go. That's that. a great, that's the best way to put it. Act like the freaking New York Yankees. And you have not lost sight of that. And I think people are, are appreciating that view that you bring. And listen, Ax, I'm not one of these guys or gals that looks at the brand and says, you have to win the World Series every year. Like, no, I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not stupid. I understand how difficult that is to do. I know there are multiple rounds of postseason. I, I know you have to get through a lot and overcome adversity. And listen, there's a reason why we have not seen a repeat champion since the Yankees in the late 90s, early 2000s. You know, the Giants have had success. They were every other year. The Red Sox had plenty of success, but they couldn't do it back-to-back years. The Astros have been pretty darn close. They've been in a World Series a bunch. I think they've been a five consecutive American League Championship Series. But that, to me, is where you draw the line. The Astros own you. The Astros have built a standard now that if you presented that to me and I was having the same narrative and tone with the Yankees, then I should be ridiculed because then it's like, well, hold on a second. You've been to the World Series a bunch. You've won a couple of titles. You're good every single year. The Yankees act like they have accomplished a lot more than they actually have over the last few years. And I'm sorry, going to the American League Championship Series and getting swept by the Houston Astros is not having me jump for joy. Ax, they haven't been in a World Series in 14 years. With their resources, with their payroll, with their brand, that's a disgrace. That's a disgrace. You brought up something a moment ago about the Steinbrenner way, and it can be looked at two ways. Steve Cohen with the Mets is basically trying to do the 2023 version of that. He's accountable to fans. He's on social media. We're spending money. We're going for it. It didn't work. But do you think Mets fans are a little more forgiving of that because they know they have their Steinbrenner now? I also think it's another factor in play that's going to give Cohen a lot more of a pass. Just look at the way acts. He was able to go and buy prospects, which is unheard of. Nobody, nobody has ever done that before. He ate so much money on that Scherzer contract. So they could go and get Acuna's brother. Now is Acuna's brother going to be any good? I have no idea, but he's a top hundred prospect. That's uncharted waters and territory for owning a baseball team where it's like, look, we have this financial strength. We tried bringing in a future Hall of Famer, Scherzer. We added another in Verlander. We thought we were going to maybe compliment the team that won 100 games a year ago. It didn't work out. Listen, for a lot of different reasons. Diaz getting hurt. Verlander hurt early in the year. Offense wasn't as good. Like A lot of reasons the Mets were in the predicament that they were in. But I give them credit for this. They could have hung around. And said, eh, we spent so much money. Let's try to make a run at the playoffs. Let's see what we can do. They weren't making the playoffs. And even if they were going to make the playoffs, they weren't going to make noise if they got into the playoffs. They said, hey, let's pivot. Let's reboot. Let's try to flex in a different kind of way. And I think if you're a smart Met fan, you say, you know what? I get it. I understand it. We'll see you next year. Now, and you mentioned those prospects. We saw a bunch come right through here at Syracuse, and I appreciate the approach the Mets have taken because it has not been, you know, AAA is just kind of this wasteland of guys that are in between AAA and the majors and maybe can't stick in the big leagues. They have brought real prospects through here and given the local fan base here uh, a reason to come to the ballpark to watch baseball and not just the, you know, the, the promotions and some of the fun things you do in minor league baseball. On the Buck Showalter move, though, did this revert back to kind of traditional uh, sacrificial lamb territory, or do you feel like it was the right move? So I'm conflicted on this because Axe, Buck Showalter didn't deserve to get fired. He won 100 games a year ago. I think he's a terrific manager. This year, he was not as good as far as making the right move, his team and the brand of baseball they were playing. You want to say that's reflective of the manager? Sure, for all the credit we gave him in 2022. We got to roast them and hold them accountable for what we saw in 2023. To me, Buck's dismissal is a victim of circumstance. And this is why I'm going to defend the Mets on this. I like Buck Showalter. I think he's a good manager. If I were taking over the team, I would want him working within the organization. 
I don't have the resume of David Stearns. David Stearns is an accomplished front office guy. They brought him in to be the director of baseball ops. Let him hire his own manager. If he goes and tells Steve Cohen, look, I'm taking the job. This is how I'm doing things. I think you have to honor that. So whether it's fair or just or reasonable, Buck Shoulder, no, it's it's none of those things. And quite frankly, I saw on Twitter, it was Sunday, right before the Bills kicked the Dolphins' ass. I'm uh, <laughs> you know, scrolling through Twitter and I get the notification that Buck's out. And I watched, you know, a few seconds of his like remarks basically breaking the news before the final game of the year. And actually it was it was depressing, man. He was sad. Yeah. You could tell he was emotional. I think as a baseball lifer, he's kind of coming to grips with the fact that he's never going to be a big league manager again. He's an older guy. and He got two or know, three jobs that I didn't think he would get. As yeah. Just like the, the and, circle and of like light baseball guy, like you said. Yeah. And it's not like he did a bad job. I mean, he won 100 no. games a year yeah. ago. He took Baltimore to the playoffs a bunch. But you know how the sport's going. You know what direction these Ivy League uh, front office types are looking to do when they hire a manager. They want him. To basically be subservient. They really do. I did a better job than Tony La Russa getting a job at uh, 96 years old again, managing in baseball. So you got to give him credit for that, right? 1,000%. But ultimately, you brought in Stearns to run the show. Yeah. I got to let him run the show. That makes sense. I I can buy that. All right. Moving to football and kind of in the same vein in that you have some an executive in charge brings in his own guy. Joe Shane and Brian Dable running the New York football giants who are just a nightmare right now. I listened to your Twitter spaces after that giant game and I am surprised they're this bad. I am surprised that I'm trying to think of the right way to put this. I never really bought into Daniel Jones, but I thought that Dable fixed him, that at least he'd be a serviceable quarterback. And I get the offensive line. I'm sure you'll talk about that as an issue here. But this is New York. The pressure cooker's there. They're not going to have the time to build this the way they should. I keep going back to this, though, JJ. I'm surprised, speaking of your own guy, that Shane and Dable went in on Daniel Jones. I thought 110% they would draft their own guy and develop him. So are we already making the determination that was the wrong move? Uh, I don't know if I can necessarily say that because of what they did last year. And maybe last year ends up being not a blessing, but a curse because when you go and make the playoffs, when you go and win a playoff game, ax, they were in a position where it was like, how do you, how do you, how do you not bring the quarterback back? You know, I know I'll bet it went the following week against the Philadelphia Eagles, but it was the sort of year where it was feel good. There was, there was a whole lot of good stuff that you saw on the football field. And to your point, It was the best football that Daniel Jones had ever played. He was surrounded by a supporting cast of players that was not particularly good outside of Saquon Barkley, and they won. Now, you know, they're not doomed because the way they set up this contract with Jones, he's the quarterback this year. He's going to be the quarterback next year. After that, they can get out of the contract pretty easily. So from that standpoint, I'm okay with it. I, 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 I understand it. Jones has got to play better. Now, the offensive line, to your point, they're missing some big pieces. Andrew Thomas, the best lineman. He's been out. By the way, he's not playing Sunday, it looks like, against the Miami Dolphins. They lost their center. But if you go and watch, and I tweeted this out about an hour and a half ago, Orlovsky, give him credit, did this great video breakdown on ESPN on one of the shows, basically detailing that, yes, the offensive line is bad, and it has cost Daniel Jones, but – it was not responsible for all of the double-digit sacks that took place in Monday night's game. And the decision-making has got to be better. That's just all there is to it. And Jones is now going to be held to a different standard. Last year, they didn't pick up the option. It was a bet-on-himself type of year. And he exceeded everybody's expectations. Well, now he's making $40-something million a year. The excuses? Some Giant fans are going to make them. I'm not. He's got to be better. You got to know Daniel Jones a little bit, right? You interviewed him weekly, and it's not like you're hanging, you know, on a Saturday night having a couple of beers with the guy. So I don't know how much you can learn from kind of a structured interview situation. But what did you learn about the guy that maybe you probably otherwise wouldn't? Um, That is exactly the same guy that he presents himself to be um, 
if you listen to his post games, if you just see clips, uh, listen, I, I think he's a great guy. I think he's hardworking. I think he loves the idea of being an NFL quarterback, but he's not something that he's not. Does that make sense? Like, yes. You yes. know, sometimes there's this persona that players or athletes will give out to the media and then they're totally different. I don't get the sense that Daniel Jones and like he may have a good sense of humor and, you know, he's breaking chops with the guys and whatnot, but I kind of think he's that same guy. So I don't get the sense he's paying too much attention to what's being said and what's being talked about when it comes to his narrative. Um, And that's probably the best for him. Try to figure out how to get the Giants out of this mess. And the problem for them, Axe, is it might get worse before it gets better because they go to Miami, they go to Buffalo in back-to-back weeks. That is, let's be honest, as tough a back-to-back as you might have in the NFL this year. JJ, I've heard a rumor you like to place a wager once in a while, right? So you, you, you can relate to this. The Jets went all in on Aaron Rodgers, and they lost the bet because of an injury. Now is a fluky way that it happened four plays into the season on Monday night football for the whole world to see. And the Jets still won that game, as I painfully recall as a Bills fan. So what now? I don't think Zach Wilson is the answer. I I know that there's kind of a split camp right now. Some people are defending him. Rodney Harrison certainly isn't at this point. I don't know if he can get better to the point where he can keep the Jets in contention. You tell me if I'm wrong there. Do you just bide your time until Rodgers can come back? Or is there something salvageable about this season? For the Jets. Well, I think next year, Rodgers is going to come back. I think he's dying to play football, and I think he'll be a Jet. Um, I agree with you on Wilson. I'm not going nuts after his performance Sunday against the Chiefs. It was encouraging. It was probably the best I've ever seen him in an NFL uniform. But in order for me to feel better about where the Jets are at, let me go see Zach Wilson in this offense torch the Denver Broncos. The Broncos have been one of the worst, if not the worst, defensive team of football. They gave up 70 freaking points to the Miami Dolphins. The following week, they spotted an awful Bears offense and an awful Justin Fields, a 21-point lead. So if I'm going to believe that the Jets can go and get back into this thing, and look, I, I think we'll both agree the division is going to come down to Miami or Buffalo, assuming everybody's healthy and assuming there are no crazy wrinkles between now and any end of the year, but if you're going to tell me the Jets are going to be in that playoff mix, here's what's got to happen for them. The defense has to be great. Not good. It has to be great. It has to f- kind of get those sort of game-changing moments and turnovers that they got week one against the Buffalo Bills. That's kind of their blueprint to go and win games. Wilson, you got to take the training wheels off. He looks so robotic running the offense against the Patriots in week three, where it was like he was afraid to make a mistake. I get it. You want to rely on your defense. I get it. You want to rely on your running game. But in the modern day NFL, you got to let your quarterback go and kind of improvise. That's his best strength. I'm not a Wilson fan. I think he was a terrible pick. But what he does best is, hey, run around. Backyard football. Allow him to use his athleticism to go and make a play. That's kind of the blueprint for the Jets now. This game Sunday against the Broncos and moving forward. And I think this game acts on Sunday. Not to put too much hype and too much emphasis on it, but you know what? I'm going to do that anyway. I think this will be a telling game for where the rest of the Jets season is going to go. If they go and win this game, I think it allows them a little bit of breathing room. Schedule eases up in November and December. And I think they can hang around that playoff mix. They lose to the Broncos on Sunday. Eagles coming up, other tough games coming up. That's where things could spiral out of control. JJ, I feel we're trudging through the mud here. Let's let's change it up a little bit. What's good about New York sports? What gives you hope? What what makes you happy in in the in the topics that you get get to cover these days? Uh, I'm excited to see Jalen Brunson in a few weeks. I, I can't believe I'm rooting for so many Villanova Wildcats. That's kind of weird. <laughs> Uh, I, and I know it's not the same uh, as I'm on with you in the 315. And, you know, I go back to that 2010 game that they filled up the dome doing the show before the game, like all the feels. I got the, uh, the the sign is somewhere in my apartment right now as we speak is that crowd shot from that 2010 game. Like I remember peak Syracuse Villanova. So it's weird that now Syracuse left the Big East. Rivalry is clearly not the same. 
but I, I, I don't like Villanova. I love all these guys, though. I can't get enough. They're such hard-nosed, smart, winning basketball players. I'm excited for the Knicks. So there you go. I gave you something. There's something. A little bit, a little sliver of hope with the NBA starting here. I, I think the Rangers might be pretty decent, too. So keep, keep, keep an eye on them in the upcoming NHL season. You brought up the Q's, though. You're a big Q's guy. As passionate as they come. I don't know how into the football you've been. We can discuss that. I know you're more of a hoops guy. Just what are you feeling? Speaking about feeling good, are you feeling good about what you see from Adrian Autry and the 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 new arrivals and just the the you know year one in the post Bayheim era? Just where where, where are you at, Hughes wise? What are you and your and your buddies and your your people you went to school with talking about? What's the vibe there? All right, two thoughts. Quick football, and then I want to get in a deeper dive with the basketball. Okay. The football, it's so crazy to think about how low the bar was for so many years that now actually you're kind of at a point, at least I am with the football team, where you you kind of expect them to be a seven-win team. They're going to go a bowl game. But how do they take that next step? I, I yeah. think that's what I'm trying to figure out. And uh, I'm sure Dino Babers and company are trying to figure out the same thing. Like, they're not embarrassing. They, they put representative products on the field for the most part, out of the last few years, how do you take that next step? That's number one. Basketball, I can't wait to watch him play. Listen, it's time for the man-to-man defense. I know Jimmy and the 2-3 zone worked for years. The sport changed. The shooting now is off the charts. Kids all trying to be the next Steph Curry coming out of AAU ball. All these teams do is shoot threes. So, unfortunately, what you saw is teams were hitting a higher clip of threes. Syracuse wasn't as athletic. And you got the result you got over the last two years, which was unwatchable, irrelevant, February into March basketball. Um, I have no idea if Red Autry can coach. I'm rooting for him. I know the team is talented. They got a lot of athletes. They should be up and down the floor. And I don't think I'm unreasonable in saying this, Axe. If they don't go to the NCAA tournament this year, this season is a monumental flop. Am I right or am I wrong? You're totally on on, on board. And I get there's somewhat of a honeymoon you've got to give Adrian Autry. At the same time, he's been sitting right there as the coach and waiting. This is the transfer portal era. They recalibrated, brought in a lot of talent that they needed, notably J.J. Starling and Naheem McLeod at center. Getting Judah Mintz back is huge. Like, each year represents its own thing, but you cannot have three straight years missing the tournament, hanging over your head in Syracuse, New York, no matter what the circumstances are. You just can't do that. That's the standard that was set. That's the standard you have to follow. It's almost the opposite of what you said about football. They've taken a step back from the standard, not only have to meet it again, but then try and take that step forward. And I think this is a team that can make the tournament. Now, the Maui Classic is brutal. It's brutal. Some of the best teams in the country are in that thing. So you kind of have to survive that, get through non-conference play where there's some other challenges in there, but then I think the ACC is is manageable. At the very least, be in the conversation for the tournament at the end of the year. And I think maybe we're backing off our tournament or bust kind of stance because, frankly, that hasn't been the conversation the last two years. And I don't want to feel that way again come March, and I'm sure you don't either. No, and those games they have early in the year, though, yeah, they're really challenging. Yeah, they're really difficult. You go and win one or two of them, though, Axe, and you beat the teams you're supposed to beat. Kind of gives you a little bit of a leg up, maybe going into the ACC. And when do you maybe, want how about those teams? that? You want them early, right? If I'm going to play any of those teams, give them to me early on. I, I guess that's the the flip side of that. Listen, I'm excited. Uh, I, I think the team's got a lot of athleticism. Uh, I, I'm glad Mince is back. I think he's going to take his game to the next step. Uh, I'll throw this out there. I think they're in the tournament this year. I do. I'm with you. I'm with you. My my predictions and everything are to come as we're slowly, you know, media days next Friday. The first like, kind of dome event they do is Friday the 13th. Like, we're getting there. But I am squarely on the fence of I'm going to be the – they're going to make the tournament guy. So, there you go. Fist, zoom fist pound. Let's on ride. One, my friend. Let's there ride. I like it. Let's ride. JJ, it is so great to catch up. It is so great to see you. Before we let you go, though, you got a lot going on. Give us the plugs. Tell everybody where we can find your stuff. I mean, too much going on, to be honest with you. That's a good thing. (laughs) Uh, We got New York, New York, two to three days a week. Ringer Podcast Network, Apple, Spotify. I do a gambling pod with Joe House and Raheem Palmer. You want to check that out on Monday and on Thursday. We call it East Coast Bias. Nightly, 
Honda Sports Night. Mets are done, so 11 Eastern, uh, Sunday to Thursday, Monday to Friday, depending on what my schedule may be. And I got one more for you. Ringer Wise, guys, Sunday morning, you want to win all your NFL bets. Cousin Sal, Joe House, Raheem Palmer, and this guy on FanDuel TV. So I know there's Woo. a lot there, but I think I covered it, buddy. I do. I think you got it. And uh, you are busy and you got a lot going on. Just got married. Congratulations to you on that, by the way. So we appreciate you giving us some time here today. Always great to catch up, my friend. We'll definitely do it again soon. All right, Axel. I'll see you in Syracuse uh, with my parka and my winter hat and uh, <laughs> whatever the January or February game of choice is going to be. 85 degrees today in October. You got to love it. I wish basketball season was this time of the year. Just saying. That's hey, thanks for hanging with us here on episode 21 of Syracuse Sports. Reminder, Saturday night after Syracuse takes on North Carolina, Emily Liker and I live post game. Look for it on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. If you can't be there live, and we hope you can, you can share your comments and post game commentary following the orange and the tar heels don't worry it'll be available to you in podcast form both on spotify youtube all the places that you get this podcast syracuse sports so we're looking forward to another post game live following syracuse and north carolina saturday night don't forget about the voicemail line at 315-552-1964 twitter brent tax media the email is b-a-x-e at syracuse.com thanks to jj for joining us today thanks to you for joining us today thanks to our friends at kraus health the exclusive health care provider of su athletics so great to have you with us here on episode 21 of syracuse sports we will talk to you next time friends